While Constantine regarded the entire world as one immense body, and perceived that the head of it all, the royal city of the Roman Empire, was bowed down by the weight of a tyrannous oppression. At first, he had left the task of liberation to those who governed the other divisions of the empire as being his superiors in point of age. But when none of these proved able to afford relief, and those who had attempted it had experienced the disastrous termination of their enterprise, he said that life was without enjoyment to him as long as he saw the imperial city thus afflicted and prepared himself for the effectual suppression of the tyranny. Being convinced, however, that he needed some more powerful aid than his military forces could afford him, he considered on what god he might rely for protection and assistance. He recollected that his father had honored the one supreme god during his whole life, and had found him to be the savior and protector of his empire, and the giver of every good thing. He therefore felt it incumbent on him to honor no other than the god of his father. Accordingly, he called on him with earnest prayer and supplications that he would reveal to him who he was and stretch forth his right hand to help him in his present difficulties. And while he was thus praying with fervent entreaty, a most marvelous sign appeared to him from the heaven, the account of which it might have been difficult to receive with credit had it been related by any other person. But since the victorious emperor himself long afterward declared it to the writer of this history, when he was honored with his acquaintance in society, and confirmed his statement by an oath, who could hesitate to accredit the relation, especially since the testimony of after time has established its truth? He said that about midday, when the sun was beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens, above the sun bearing the inscription, Conquer by this. At the sight he himself was struck with amazement, and his whole army also, which happened to be following him on some expedition, and witnessed the miracle. He said, moreover, that he doubted within himself what the import of this apparition could be. And while he continued to ponder and reason on its meaning, night imperceptibly drew on, and in his sleep the Christ of God appeared to him with the same sign which he had seen in the heavens and commanded him to procure a standard made in the likeness of that sign, and to use it as a safeguard in all engagements with his enemies. At the dawn of day he arose and communicated the secret to his friends, and then calling together the workers in gold and precious stones, he sat in the midst of them and described to them the figure of the sign he had seen, bidding them represent it in gold and precious stones, and this representation I myself have had an opportunity of seeing. Now it was made in the following manner. A long spear overlaid with gold formed the figure of the cross by means of a piece transversely laid over it. On top of the whole was fixed a crown formed by the intermixture of gold and precious stones. And on this, two letters indicating the name of Christ symbolized the Savior's title by means of its first characters. The letter Rho being intersected by Ki exactly in its center. In these letters the emperor was in the habit of wearing on his helmet at a later period. Being struck with amazement at the extraordinary vision, and resolving to worship no other god save him who had appeared to him, he sent for those who were acquainted with the mysteries of his doctrines, and inquired who that god was, and what was intended by the sign of the vision he had seen. They affirmed that he was God, the only begotten Son, of the one and only God, that the sign which had appeared was the symbol of immortality, and the trophy of the victory over death which he had gained in time past when he was sojourning on earth. They taught him also the causes of his advent, and explained to him the true account of his incarnation. Comparing therefore the heavenly vision with the interpretation given, he found his judgment confirmed, and in the persuasion that the knowledge of these things had been imparted to him by divine teaching, he determined thenceforth to devote himself to the perusal of the inspired writings. Moreover, he made the priests of God his counselors, and deemed it incumbent on him to honor God, who had appeared to him with all devotion. And after this, being fortified by well-grounded hopes in him, he undertook to quench the fury of the fire of tyranny. Assuming, therefore, the Supreme God is his patron, and invoking his Christ to be his preserver and aid, and setting the victorious trophy, the salutary symbol, 
in front of his soldiers and bodyguard. He marched with his whole forces, eager to reinstate the Romans in the freedom they had inherited from their ancestors. And whereas Maxentius trusted more in his magic arts than in the affection of his subjects, dared not even advance outside the city gates, but guarded every place and district and city subject to his tyranny, with large bodies of soldiers and numberless ambuscades. The emperor, confiding in the help of God, advanced against the first and second and third divisions of the tyrant's forces, defeated them all with ease at the first assault, and made his way into the very interior of Italy.